So um, I'm here with Kate Bingham from SV Health Investors. Um, and so I have a number of questions for her to kick off Bio Europe. Um, so my first one is you've seen quite a range of investments um, over your long career. Um, what were the biggest lessons that you drew? The biggest lessons for me, oh, okay, <laughs> um, are about finding some really disruptive science, finding really strong people, um, and putting a financing plan that actually allows you to, to develop it. So I'd almost put it the other way around. What are the things that have have we have we not put in place that has caused um, things to fail? Well, if it's not really disruptive science and it's sort of me too or uh, it's not radically interesting to make a, a significant impact on patients, actually partners and you know commercial pharmaceutical companies and so on um, are not as interested. I mean, the, the move of industry now is they don't know commercial BD group now wants the eighth statin. They want the next uh, first in class, best in class uh, disruptive technology. So I think disruptive high impact uh, to patients is a really important uh, theme. Second on, on, on people is we can have some really fun and exciting science, but if you don't have good people to execute, that can be a real problem and I would include investors in the people so that if you don't have a good board of directors that can be very negative to a company so again what is a lesson make sure that you are working with very competent experienced and like-minded investors not that you have to always agree but that uh, you will have the same ultimate goals and you'll have a good shot at doing that um, and then within the team, you want to, you want to, it needs to be led by a CEO who is in a hurry, because somebody who comes with a uh, bureaucratic mindset to want to cross every T and dot every I before they do anything is not going to work in biotech. So uh, I have some CEOs who are just completely brilliant, and I get pestered all weekend with ideas or this, or what about that, and have you, can, I, can I talk to you about this? That is really good. So, disruptive science, really strong management, and then the whole plan has to be fundable at a scope that we can actually deliver, so that if you have both those two things, but actually it's going to take you $100 million and five years before you even know if you're on the right path, that's not something that um, we can do. So. For us, it's all about making sure that the plan you invest in gets you some early data points that gives you high conviction to continue funding and really um, double down. So lessons would be those three things have to be in place for me before I take it further. Um, so then on the subject of dis uh, disruptive science and no me too kinds of drugs, um, it's, big Pharma has definitely taken up the charge with combining checkpoint inhibitors with things, um, but there's also a fair number of biotechs that are doing it, like um, Transgene comes to mind, or um, a number of uh, vaccine or virus companies. Um, how would you, what would you say to them um, about, do you, is that a Me Too drug, or do you think that would cut it as far as your investment is concerned? And a very good question. So the the checkpoints, if you think about why did cancers not respond to therapy, one is that they've got a, a repressive um, tumour microenvironment. So that's where checkpoints are good, to, to decloak the tumour to the immune system. So that's important. Then you need two other things. The second thing you need is something, some form of antigen that actually tells the immune system that this is... Um, foreign and needs to be taken out and the third thing is you need a sufficient immune response to actually be able to do it so are checkpoints fundamental to as a backbone in, in uh, cancer therapy I suspect in many cases yes but th that's only one of the three things we need so certainly um, we are looking very hard at how can you identify those cancer antigens ideally not personalized because I think ultimately if you have to develop drugs for individuals, um, that's going to be a huge cost to health, uh, the health systems, and ultimately I don't think is a, a broad, durable system. So we're much more interested in what are the pan uh, antigens that apply across all, t all uh, different cancer types so that you can get um, vaccines that will treat all patients with that form of cancer. Um, and then how can you, what else can we do to elicit a really strong immune response um, combined with checkpoints so how do you make cold tumors hotter and how do you make hot tumors completely eliminated so a really good question though 
Um, but on the same subject about um, personalized medicine, um, so if you don't think it's going to work, but the FDA just um, approved Keytruda for a specific genetic signature, um, do you think that will be a viable approach, or could you um, expand upon that with that in mind? Yeah, so I, I, I have no issue with that. It's the because that's th then you're actually linking the G to the drug to a specific, uh, as you say, genetic signature. And what I, what I'm rejecting is the idea that. Uh, every person is going to have a completely personalized vaccine based on their tumor makeup. Now, I know there's plenty of evidence that people are doing that now, but in the long term, I think that's non-durable. Um, so also in the, in the things that you learned uh, from investment, um, you brought up how it's very important to have all of your interests aligned with, between the investors and the company and the CEO. Um, there's one company, um, MRC Technology, that's been rebranded to LifeArc, and they've um, decided that they're going to operate um, sort of with the VC model, but um, as charity investors. So all of their returns go back to their fund. Uh, would that be a problematic um, divergence of interest for you? Or um, how do you think charity investment would work? What, what was the, what investment did you say? They, they um, charity investment. Charity, yeah. So um, no, I think it's I think it's entirely consistent. I mean, their their goal is to build up an increasing evergreen part of permanent capital. Mm -hmm. So they are completely motivated to make returns so that they can continue being able to invest. So no, I don't think that's a uh, a conflict at all. Um, what we're interested in is make, is building disruptive medicines that generate returns for shareholders. Now whether those returns get distributed back to our investors who then reinvest back in our funds or they just get recycled back into a life act fund, fine. That's nice to hear. Um, so uh, I also had a question about pricing um, and how, or I, we were talking earlier about uh, um, how there was uh, an amendment in California that tried to cap um, funding but lobbying was too hard. Um, but you brought up that it was actually a pricing issue. Um, how, with regards to CAR-T, particularly in personalized medicine, everything you've been saying, could you describe your view of the pricing argument and what do you think would work? Well, I'm absolutely not a pricing expert. Um, I guess my view is, is you've got two extremes between uh, where I come from in the UK, where we've got an incredibly stringent health economic uh, backdrop where only the very exceptional uh, drugs with very strong health economics arguments are actually getting reimbursed. And then you go to the other extreme in California where, um, or US in general, where there is much less pricing pressure. So I think ultimately we need to end up somewhere in between. Um, then no doubt needs to be much more serious work done. Um, and I would apply that to the companies we invest in um, to think about the whole health economic argument and how you can develop drugs that don't cost half a million dollars uh, and will be within reach for health systems and, and payers. So um, I think it, 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 the, the onus is on us to start building some of that cost benefit argument early into the trials we do so that actually ultimately we end up with pricing that, that is acceptable. I, I am not in favour of super high pricing for very short uh, incremental benefit because that's ultimately is not going to be a, a durable business. Okay, so then to shift gears to the science part of it, um, you guys look at, I think it was uh, inflammatory disease, autoimmune disease, oncology, um, and you recently um, started the Dementia Discovery Fund. Um, what's your view of Alzheimer's in general, or how would you characterize the space now that there have been some major uh, drug failures from Eli Lilly and Merck? Um, but then also, uh, what do you think of the A-beta uh, amyloid plaque uh, versus the tau argument? That's a lot of questions. So. My fundamental view on, on dementia is that we have had, unusually, an incredibly narrow-minded view of the disease. So that if you look at the dollars that have been invested both in academia as well as in uh, pharmaceutical R&D, uh, it has been largely focused around the amyloid beta cascade. So the thesis that you get overexpression of this sticky protein amyloid, they form plaques which cause neuronal toxicity and ultimately death. Um, and so, as you say, there'd be multiple failures for interventions at all parts of that cascade. And it's not that we reject the association between APOE4, amyloid and Alzheimer's, but we do reject that that is the only um, biological hypothesis that people are using. So that in the Dementia Discovery Fund that we've launched, um, we are explicitly looking for uh, biological interventions outside amyloid beta. And if you think of oncology, um, 15 years ago we used to talk about tumours according to the organ. So we'd talk about 
breast cancer or lung cancer or colon cancer. Now we talk about a HER2 positive breast cancer or triple negative. So we actually talk about the drivers of disease. And, you know, I'm still talking about Alzheimer's. Now, do I think there's a single cause of Alzheimer's and a single disease? No way. And it's... And now we've seen what oncology has done by unpicking the different biological um, mechanisms that drive the cancer with genetics and tools that allow you to actually target individual um, cell types and tumor types. I think we've got exactly the same opportunity to do that in, in dementia. So we are specifically looking um, outside amyloid beta, we're looking at microglial biology. So these are immune cells in the, in the brain. Um, we're looking at uh, mitochondrial, mitochondrial dynamics, so when you get dysfunction in, the, in mitochondria, how does that uh, cause um, and trigger neuronal death, neurodegeneration? Um, we're looking at synaptic health, so how can you actually improve the um, signaling between synapses? Um, and we're looking opportunistically, we're looking at DNA damage response in, in neurodegeneration. So our, our goal is to open up whole new areas of biology for um, broadly dementia in ways that haven't been looked at before and importantly we're not trying to do this all by ourselves so um, there is a obviously when we hear it by Europe uh, there are a ton of companies that have done a, a huge amount of work looking at non neurodegenerative diseases but actually lots of those biological mechanisms may well be relevant in the brain so one of the things we are looking at is where can we partner with other companies to leverage the work they've done in their peripheral indications that we can then apply to neurodegeneration and I think this is a uh, wide open space and really exciting. Okay, my last question. Um, you penned a scathing letter about the gender dynamics at J.P. Morgan a couple of years ago. Is it at all your sense that things have improved or have they gotten worse? Um, no, they've certainly not got, gotten worse and they are, I would think, actually are definitely improving. Here in Europe, I think we're, we're generally better on gender balance compared to the U.S. Um, I think there's a broader question about diversity across in general but but uh, specifically on gender we name check two uh, companies in the letter to Bio century one of them our life science advisors um, have become complete advocates and very serious uh, pioneers now in supporting gender diversity um, I've joined the advisory board they've created a non-profit um, to specifically help well-qualified senior women join boards of biotech companies um, and they've been placing, I think they've now done 12 uh, board placements of high, well-qualified women onto biotech companies um, and I'm helping them do that. And I think that is a very clever way of increasing diversity because clearly what we ultimately want is a lot more women CEOs running these companies. But actually, a stepping stone to doing that is to make sure that those women who have good backgrounds who are capable of doing it, if they can get board exposure in another biotech company in addition to the company in which they're working, actually I think that will be a very valuable experience for them to then take the next step into, into the CEO slot. So um, I actually am really amazed by how much progress has been made um, and really pleased by the, the broad attention it's got from industry. Uh, one follow-up question. Um, do you think quotas will work um, until we get to the point where um, there's no problem anymore? Uh, no, because I think everyone hates quotas and it's also no one will respond to that because we're in a, again if you take biotech, we're in a, such a high risk area that if I'm told I have to recruit somebody because she's a woman or they're ethnic and they have some you know, racial diversity angle rather than recruit the best person, I won't do that. But should we enrich search um, uh, recruitment processes so that you absolutely make sure that everyone every time a position is filled you're saying have we got the broadest range of candidates from, who, from which to choose I think we should be doing that but not quotas per se no. Great well with that thank you very much for joining us at BioEurope um, and we'll see you around. Excellent uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks.